Well, good evening again, and yes, Jesus is good, and we're going to be talking about that tonight, um, how good he is, and how good I'm not, and how good you're not, but he is good. So um, last week, Mark taught from Ephesians chapter 1, so we're going to go into Ephesians chapter 2 just a little bit. And as you're turning there, we will lift this study up to the Lord. Father, we do just thank you um, for your word, Lord, the abundance of it in our lives. And Lord, you have blessed us so much that we know you very well because of your word. And Lord, those who would teach your word. And um, Lord, this church where we can come and um, be fed. Lord, what a blessing we have in knowing you. And um, so, Lord, tonight we just ask that as your word is open, that your Holy Spirit would speak to each one of us, Lord, as you see fit. Um, Lord, we trust you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, last week, Mark taught chapter 1. And just to go back to the end of chapter 1, because it's kind of important in going into chapter 2, but in verse 22, it says, And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Um, So as Christians, we know that Jesus is in control of everything, and we trust him in that, and that all matters in our life, he is trustworthy, and our only job truly is to keep our eyes on him and to learn from him and his ways. Um, So when we consider... uh, that he is in control of everything, um, that it pertains to this evening, and it pertains to every piece of our life from beginning to end. But um, it is kind of awesome to consider that everything right now is under the feet of Jesus, and he is over all, not some, he is over all. Um, And I can tell you, today was kind of a crazy day of just multitasking at work and I had a lot of different things going on a lot of fires to put out and those types of things Um, I was all over the place I got a text from Joey this morning and I think I answered him about four hours later that's how busy I was and usually if Joey tags I'll text back pretty quick but that's just the kind of day that it was Um, how much of that time did I, you know, spend in worship of Jesus? I will tell you about zero. Um, it just was not that kind of a day. Um, but what I know, and as, you know, I have a, and you have a laser focus on Jesus and who he is, which is so important that a day like today is okay because I know that he is in control of everything and whatever tasks were happening in my life today, it was really all about him. I mean, he was working in and through everything that I was doing because that's what he does with all of us. He works in and through everything that we do, um, you know, for his glory. Um, So when we talk about, you know, being focused on and having a laser focus on Jesus um, you know, the, this chapter, or at least the beginning of the chapter, really gets into the reality, I think, uh, of what that is. And it doesn't mean that, you know, every second of every day you're worshiping at the top of the mountain, because we're not called to do that. We are in the valley, we are serving, um, and you cannot realistically always have your eye on the Lord. You know, you're doing tasks, you're working, whatever it is you're doing, um, but we can just trust the Lord that he is watching over it all. Um, so if you've submitted your will to his will, and you know that's a big part of understanding as a Christian is that your will has to, um, his will has to supersede yours or mine. 
Um, I have to, you know, I wake up in the morning and I say, Lord, what is it that you want to accomplish today? Um, you know, keep me in your will. I, no effort on my part, but I really would like to be in his will because if I'm not in his will, um, I'm not just floating around and have no responsibility. And we know that because um, we either get to serve the Lord or serve Satan. There is no in-between. And, you know, I think most human beings kind of think they're not serving anyone, maybe themselves, certainly in our, our culture. But that is not the truth. I mean, the truth is I would rather serve um, a nice master and my friend. Uh, that is what I would rather be doing. So the only way to do that is really to submit to his will and through the spirit and through the study of his word. Um, we can see this verse 22 that it is real, you know, that he is in, you know, he is all in all. And we can read a verse like Romans 8, 28, and we absolutely can agree that all things work together for the good of those that love God and are called according to his purpose. We see it. Um, it's not hard to see. If you have that laser focus on Jesus and you're training yourself up in him, you can see it, that it's chaos in the world, but you can see that the Lord is in control, and you can look on things from your past and see where the Lord was and how faithful he was when it just, in the midst of it, it didn't seem like that. Um, but as a Christian, you can, um, you can indeed see this. Um, so you need a laser focus as if the Lord was Winnie the Pooh, okay? Do you want me to explain that or just leave it there? So Joshua, our grandson, Justin's son, um, he's pretty robust, and he will move around the house, and when, when he comes to visit um, Grandpa and Abuela, he, like, goes from basketball to riding with chalk on the patio, and then he wants to play with Legos, and then he wants a pop, a popsicle, which now I'm addicted to popsicles, and I have to be careful because I'm eating into a stash, you know. Um, so <laughs> I make sure we have them. But um, if we put on Winnie the Pooh, he is laser focused. And everything else just kind of goes away. And he will sit with his eyes fixed on Winnie the Pooh. And you can tickle him, and he'll look at you and laugh, and he will go right back to Winnie the Pooh. And you can stand in front of him, you know, like while he's what, and then he'll go, um, you know, that is laser fixed on Winnie the Pooh. And that is how we need to be with the Lord. You know, we have to be just absolutely fixed on him because he is, he fills all in all. Um, he is our very purpose. But the reality, or, or at least my reality, is, you know, our eyes, um, they wander from Jesus. Um, they just do. And if you start looking at the world without this laser focus on Jesus, so you start looking at our country, um, it's frightening. And it doesn't seem like anything's in control, and it seems like somebody else is in control. And in reality, somebody else is in control, right? I mean, Satan is in control. If your will is not submitted to Jesus, by default it is submitted to Satan. So... Um, it sure looks like it. You know, if you take your eyes off the Lord, it sure looks like things are pretty bad out there. Um, but the truth is, is that Satan is not in control. We know that the Lord, um, everything has been put under his feet. So if you know that, then you can look at this world and you can look at the madness and you can just say, hey, the Lord's in control. I know he's in control. And you don't, have, you don't have to fret over what you see, where the most of the world does fret over what they're seeing, or they just don't care, or whatever. But um, we don't have to see it that way. We can see the Lord in all of it. Um, so as we hit chapter uh, 2, um, you know, chapter 1, it really kind of establishes that the Lord is in control of everything. 
And then chapter 2 kind of gets more about, okay, well, what does that mean for me or for you? So verse 1 says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Um, so it's kind of a, I contemplated a, this a little bit as I was preparing to teach, and, you know, I was dead. So, um, you know, wherever I was at that time when I got saved, or if I wasn't saved today, you know, I could say from today, my future ends, um, the remainder of my days, however many there are, they end in death, um, and eternal death. You know, that is the reality of what a human being faces without the Lord. But here it says that he, you, (laughs) not he, you, he made alive. So the Lord has made me alive, and he has made you alive. Um, He has given us life. Now you look at the remainder of your days, and however long they may be, and in the end, what I see, and I think what you probably see, is life. I see life. I see the Lord at the end of, at the end of the journey. I see a Savior with His arms, um, you know, open wide, ready to receive uh, who I am in a very loving way. And then we know the promises of heaven, and uh, that there is no death and no tears. And so we're we're heading towards perfection, perfect love, which is in Jesus. Um, So that is what we have because he has made us alive Um, in a world of death. He has given us life. So we owe everything to Jesus. I mean, our, our, um, you know, everything that we're about is, is about him. And and really, um, what that means is that I have done nothing good. I did not save myself. He saved me. He paid for my sins on the cross. Um, so when it comes to, to my walk with the Lord, it's pathetic. But I trust him. He's all in all. I am not. Um, and I think that's really important to understand, particularly um, for mature Christians. You know, like we kind of think we're getting kind of good at this Christian life. You're terrible. I'm terrible. Um, It's filthy rags is the way that it's described. Um, It is all about the Lord, and that that is so important to understand. He has given us life where we had a future of death. Um, So back to verse 1, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked According to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So this speaks right to this truth that um, you may think you're not serving anybody, but you are. There is no other option. You're serving the Lord or you're serving the devil. And Bob Dylan had a little song about it. A lot of people knew from the 70s or 80s, but uh, it's just the truth. Um, Jesus himself in Matthew um, 6, 24 said, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. So you can choose. You can choose to serve a loving God, who gave his own life for you to save you, or you can serve the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan. Um, And there is sort of a phenomenon, and it is a real phenomenon, uh, that manifests in very real ways. But in, you know, we've had a radio station ministry here for um, decades that uh, Jack started, and I didn't get involved uh, in it until, whatever, five or six years ago. It is awful. It is spiritual warfare like you would not believe, and nothing ever works. You can't get the whole system to work at once. 
You know, and people have to call and say, I can't hear what's on the radio, or there's a hum on the radio. It is amazing the spiritual warfare that goes when you are trying to broadcast God's word out over the airwaves when the, the, the uh, Satan, the prince of the power of the air, absolutely detests what we're doing. Um, and anybody that does work in the radio ministry or has ever worked in the radio ministry will confirm that is some of the most amazing spiritual warfare you've ever seen. And you just can't ever get it perfect um, because Satan hates it. Uh, so we're sort of invading his space. So it's quite literal in that way as far as the power of the air goes. Um, but you got to serve the Lord or you're going to serve Satan or you are in present tense doing that. Um, The only, the only difference between, I think, somebody who's serving the Lord, which would be you folks, and people that are serving Satan, is that we actually realized that there was a choice to be made. You know, somehow the Holy Spirit, when we were enemies of Jesus, the Holy Spirit said, hey, you have to pick here. You got to... You got to go with a guy who has the power over sin and death, or you really are serving Satan. When I grew up, I knew the Lord as a young kid from my grandparents, but I didn't walk with the Lord, and I never really thought, oh, I'm serving Satan here. That's pretty cool. Never thought that. I just figured I'll get around to serving the Lord, who I knew who he was, um, you know, later in my life. But I, I didn't think I was serving Satan, but I was. Um, and we all were at that point before we got saved. So, you know, the only difference is um, we've made, we recognized that there was, there was a choice that had to be made between Jesus and Satan, and we made the choice. It's the only difference. Other than that, everybody I'm around on a daily basis is a scumbag, and I'm a bigger scumbag. I mean, that's just the truth. Um, there is sin. Sin is in this body, in the flesh. The only difference is, is that we realized there was a choice to be made, and we made the choice. That's the only difference. And the reason why that's important is because when you look out, you know, on all the lost sheep and the people that don't know the Lord, you should be looking with compassion. Um, and the only message that you have for them is to say, hey, there is a choice that needs to be made. And let me tell you about the good choice and who he is. That's all you have. You'll never have anything else. You're never going to be good enough to do it on your own. Your example that you set for people as a Christian ain't going to do it because you're going to fail. You've got to point them to Jesus. And so really the awesome thing about how the Lord works with us in ministry and in life is that he makes us so bad, and we know our own sin. I mean, you guys don't know my sin. I know my sin. My wife knows a lot of it, but... Um, the message never changes. It's always, you go to Jesus. You got to go to Jesus. Don't go to me. Go to Jesus. And that message has sustained for 2,000 years because no man has been able to say, well, come to me. And the ones that have, have absolutely failed, uh, and it's been a tragedy. Um, so it's sad to me that we have this sinful nature, but but in reality, if we didn't, then we'd be taken, trying to take it all away from Jesus. You know, we know who we are, we know who he is, and I think that is like very, very, very important. Uh, verse 3, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Um, and so there it is, you know, I mean, we're no, no different than the others. We're just saved, and we have something to offer the world in our Savior, not in ourselves. Um, and I would venture to say that um, some of you still have sin, even though, even though you're saved, or maybe all of you. Uh, I think that's just uh, the reality. Um, and I think what's important about this and, and where we're going to kind of go a little bit with this message, too, is that, you know, if you ever think that you're somehow better than 
non-believers or that you have finally achieved some sort of behavior that the Lord is so proud of you that you don't really don't need his sacrifice because you're so good. If you ever get there um, to that point in your life where you think you've achieved a higher moral standard as a Christian uh, and you merit now something, a trip to heaven or whatever, um, then you got to really check yourself and say, okay, wait a minute. Um, that, that is not the, the message. Uh, it is all about grace, which is what we're going to read now. So verse 4, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love <clears throat> with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we are his workmanship, created. So not only are you his workmanship, he created you. He knows everything about you. He knit you together in your mother's womb and in my mother's womb. And so he created you, he knows everything about you, and he knows how to work with you. But it is all to his credit. It is his good work that will flow through us as Christians or as a church um, that will benefit others, and others will come to know our God because of that. So it is not by anything good that we do. It is what good he has done <clears throat> and how he takes your life when you submit your will to him and then he has workmanship he is the hands of the potter and he is good at what he does um, so any good that we do is <clears throat> excuse me his accomplishment not my accomplishment not yours um, and i really believe that um you know, if you if you start thinking you're getting pretty good at this, being a Christian, then, you know, you merit anything, it's not a blatant thing. And that's why I think the Bible speaks so clearly to it. It's very subtle. I think when you don't even realize you're doing it and you start thinking, I'm pretty good at this. I'm a pretty good Christian or I'm a pretty good pastor or whatever it is. And it's really subtle. And, and as a Christian, you would say, well, wait, man, I'm humble. But Satan knows how to, to, you know, drive those types of things into our heart as well, and, and our sin is really good at that. So, you know, just recognize that it's, um, it's not necessarily even a conscious choice that you make, um, you know, spiritual pride. It's very subtle. So you got to kind of recognize it if it's creeping in and, and uh, get rid of it, you know. But uh, back in verse 4, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he had, um, he loved us. Um, it is not talking about us. It is talking about God. It's talking about the Lord and that he is rich in mercy. <clears throat> and first and foremost, that he loves us. And in verse 5, um, it says that he made us alive together with Christ. Um, that is his work that he has done, not work that we have done. And in verse 6 it says, and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Um, he has raised us up. We have not done that. He has done that. And then in verse 7, uh, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Um, he is kind. Um, 
And when we were singing that uh, last song tonight, I mean, he is good. I mean, God is truly good for all these things. He loves us. He's so rich in mercy. He is kind. Um, and it is in his grace and his kindness. Um, and if none of that spoke to you, then you go right to verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So in case none of that is clear, then that should be pretty clear. Um, it is only by his grace that we stand, period. Uh, and we know that. And we love that. So, um, you know, if you think you're getting pretty good at being a Christian, just be careful. Um, and I'm going to give you one other application of that, uh, which is if you think your pastors are getting pretty good at it, they're not either. Um, and that is a problem. Um, people will tend to look at who's on the stage and think that they're somehow, their behavior is better than yours. Um, they're at a different standard with the Lord, and they are not. And I love Joey, and I think Joey probably feels the same about me, but we are just two guys uh, trying to figure out how to do this. That is it. And really, a lot of prayer goes towards this church with the, with the board, um, the elders here, and that we just want to reach people with the gospel. That's it. But we are all fall so far short. So be careful, you know, if you look at a pastor and think, um, well, you know, if I have uh, Pastor Rob pray for me, it's probably going to be better than if I have Pastor Matt because Rob's more righteous or whatever. I mean, those are the things that go on in people's heads. That was a bad example. I should have used Joey. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Rob. Um, but those are things, and, and I've done that myself. I, I remember being at a pastor's conference and, uh, can't remember who it was, but the, all the pastors were lined up, and there were kind of lines of people to pray. And there was, I think it was Damien Kyle, and I'm like, I need Damien for this. This is an important one. And I got I got to get Damien, and I got, uh, uh, I won't say who, but I got somebody else. I got somebody else, and it was a great prayer, but I was like, oh, that's, whoops. I was like, that wasn't Damien, so I don't know if that prayer actually worked, but... Yeah, I mean, we tend to do that. And, and the problem with that is that means we're not really keeping our eyes on Jesus. And um, inevitably, when you see pastors get lifted up beyond what they truly are, they fall. And then what happens is if your faith was in the Calvary Chapel pastor of the giant Calvary Chapel, and he falls and does something really bad, then, oh, your faith is, oh, my faith is a mess now because the pastor was a sinner. Well, they're all sinners, you know. And there are certain things in ministry that we are held accountable to. There absolutely is. And if you don't do those things or you do things, you know, it can be definitely a problem with your ministry. But in truth, you know, I've, um, I've seen great pastors that I thought were great pastors fall. I have seen the best pastors I know make horrible decisions that I, I know are incorrect and have led to a lot of problems. It has never shaken my faith. I honestly, I didn't think they were that great to start with, you know. And in Calvary Chapel, we have the greatest example because we had Chuck Smith, who was a righteous dude, and he loved people. And that's what was so great about him is he loved people. Um, but, you know, when he died, a lot of bad things started happening around Calvary Chapel because Chuck's gone. Well, that's because people's eyes were on Chuck a little bit more than they should have been probably. But uh, Calvary Chapel is a great example of one guy who was just a tremendous human being um, that people kind of probably got lost in worship a little bit of and shouldn't have. Um, so for us, we, um, we keep our eyes on Jesus. And then we can endure any event like that. It is a piece of cake, um, you know. And it's sad to see bad things happen and people fall. It has nothing to do with my relationship with the Lord. It really doesn't because it's just laser focus on him. And I think because I, earlier in my life, I went through a divorce that was wretched. Um, and I really, like, didn't even know it was happening when it happened and 
the Lord, the night it happened, the Lord spoke to me and he said, you know, you're going to lose your wife, your kids, your house. He didn't say job, but I did eventually lose that. But, and he said, all you're going to have left is me. Is that okay? And I was like two in the morning. And I said, you know what? That is okay. And so, you know, when people fall for me, it's like, I, I just, I'm sad for it, but it just, it never floors me. I just kind of go on and and move to the next thing with the Lord because I know people are going to fail and, and it happens and, um, and it's sad, but it just, no faith in people. I mean, that's a bad, bad, bad move. Trust the Lord. He will always take care of you. Um, so to kind of illustrate this a little bit deeper, I wanted to go to Romans uh, chapter 7. Just you, so you guys don't think I'm making it up. Because <laughs> I'm not making it up. <clears throat> so Romans chapter 7. And verse, uh, starting in verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice, but what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now... It is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice." Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I'm going to continue. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it's a lot of words about that are just flat out true. Um, about this war that goes on inside us, and we want to do good, but then we find ourselves not doing good. Um, And there's things that, you know, we say, I would never do that, and you find yourself doing it. It is just the reality, but really the only thing that is so important in that is that I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He has saved you. Um, You are forgiven. You have been set free from so many things. And, you know, in truth, uh, as a Christian, um, you become more conscious of others. And in doing that, your behavior does tend to get better, but it's never good enough. Um, And you're going to make mistakes. We all do. Um, But the whole point of all that is just to draw us and get our laser focus where it needs to be, which is on Jesus, who never failed who never had a war uh, between the good and evil that he couldn't win. I mean, he never sinned. Um, And he was tempted, right? So, And he had a body like we do. Um, But he pulled it off. He's the only one who's ever pulled it off. So our eyes need to be fixed on him, Um, not ourselves, nobody else. And just realize that, you know, if Paul who was a fairly righteous guy, I would imagine. I mean, if this is his life story and the struggles he had, and he was, you know, bigger than Chuck Smith, right? I mean, he's, he's all over this Bible. He wrote a lot of it. I mean, if he's having this battle, understand it's okay. You're having the battle. 
Um, you know, I mean, you just have to keep your eyes on the Lord and pray. And, um, you know, the Lord will, he'll take things away that, that are just not good for you. Um, if that's his will, he's good at it. He, he's like, he's a surgeon. He knows how to take care of things. But, you know, when you look at your own flaws um, that we all have, you know, the, you just thank God that Jesus Christ <laughs> He died on a cross for you. It's okay. He's got you covered. So we will finish tonight in James chapter 4. And it says in in verse 1, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure? That war in your members. So there Paul is talking about this. I I don't do what I should do, and I do what I shouldn't do. And now James is referring to this war in your members. You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war that you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that, the friend, that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world and makes himself an enemy of God... Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So we know that, I mean, the Lord is, he wants us to humble ourselves in his sight. Because he knows exactly who we are, and he knows exactly who he is. Um, And he will, um, if you think you're getting good at this Christian life, that is pretty much an indication of pride, and he resists the proud, not interested. He wants honesty. And we talked about that already, but why does he want so much honesty? Because he doesn't want you going around telling people you're the Messiah, He wants you going around saying, I'm a saved sinner, but let me introduce you to the Messiah, the one who can save you. Um, That message has to stay intact. Therefore, we get to live with some sin in our lives because that's what's going to keep it intact. Um, But we will humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, and if we do that, he lifts us up. like we talked about, we are on, on a path to death, to eternal damnation, and he has put us on a path to life. He alone is good. Just like the song that we sang tonight. I mean, it is him. He is good. Um, let's go on a little farther here in verse 7. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. That's heavy stuff, but um, I think that's what the Lord wants us to be looking at as we look at ourselves, you know. Um, it's not, a, it's not a, a joke, and it's not a big laugh, and, you know, we have a lot of fun in this life. I have a lot of fun in, in this life, but the Lord wants us to consider who we really are so we will know who he is. That is why. And when it says uh, in the second part of verse 9, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. I mean, the Lord wants you to see it for what it is, because if you don't, you're going to start being getting a little proud of how good you are at this. 
and then the message changes. And that is what you cannot do. So verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Be honest with him about who you are and the needs that you have and the things that you can not do well, um, the mistakes that you've made. Um, humble yourselves, and he'll lift you up. He is so good at lifting you up, and he is so good at restoring where things have gone wrong in your life. He's amazingly good at it. Um, so if you humble yourselves in his sight, that is what he will do. He will restore you. Um, he will make you into the man or woman that he always intended for you to be. Um, and a vessel in which the gospel will be shared. In verse 11, do not speak e evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother... And judges his brother, speaks evil of the law, and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? So this is the, it's, it's following the same line of thinking in that if you let you know, any kind of pride build up in you about how good you are of a Christian, you, you destroy the message of the gospel and that Jesus is the only one good. Um, but then you also spend your time judging everybody else uh, because you, I'm getting pretty good at this and why aren't these people getting good at it? You know, what are, what are they not getting? I've been like doing this for 30 years I've been through the Bible 18 times, and why are these guys having a problem? They've been sitting next to me for 30 years. Well, that, you know, that is not what we're supposed to be doing. Um, and and it, it is only pride that, that drives your heart to do that. It is not love for one another and humbling yourself and, and being there to help people. Um, it's just pride that will do that. And then verse 13, come now. You who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. And I think that, um, I think as a family, this is the way that we live, and I think as a church, this is the way that we live also. Um, we kind of know that our existence is temporal, that we're not here for eternity. We just want to serve the Lord. Um, and we really do want the Lord's will above ours. And so, you know, starting each day, ending each day with, Lord, your will be done. Um, it's just so important versus my will. Uh, and if you do that, man, you're serving Jesus. You are serving the good shepherd, the good master. Um, and then all of a sudden, Romans 8.28 just works out because your faith is in him, your eyes are on him, and you're giving your will to him, and you're giving each day to him and saying, Lord, you supersede every, all of our plans, and it is amazing what the Lord will do with that. Um, if you give up uh, every piece of your life that you can give up will be better if you give it to him. And we all hold things back, but, um, you know, in the way that you treat people, if you give that to him, and just your plans about your finances or whatever, you know, your future, um, you know, trust him and let him handle it. He will, he will definitely do a better job than, than we could ever do. Um, so he alone is good. That is kind of the crux of this whole thing. Um, I'm just forgiven for my bad, that's all. 
he's good, I'm forgiven. Um, and in truth, you know, I serve the Lord because he is good. You know, I feel like it's, it's not really out of obligation. Um, you know, it's been almost 30 years, I guess, I've been at this church, but it's been a pure joy in the things that we've done. And there's been heartache and there's been hard things to do, but it really hasn't been out of obligation. And if it was out of obligation, I probably would have quit a long time ago. I really would have. Um, but it's just love for the people in this church and um, love for one another and, and love for the Lord. And I think, um, you know, we really do, as, as a church body, I can honestly say we daily fix our eyes on Jesus in all the things that we do we seek as well we make mistakes but um, we're not trying to like do anything else with this church we're not trying to grow anything bigger that's just not what we do um, we just want to serve the Lord and however he'll let us do it that's what we desire to do um, so if we're honest about who we are and we keep our eyes fixed on the Lord, laser focused, like you're watching Winnie the Pooh, right? I'm sure you're like all of everybody's grandkids have done that, but I maybe I'm just seeing it anew for the first time, but it is truly amazing. I think I do that a lot, but Ingrid doesn't. Like Ingrid's very attentive, but she'll be talking to me when I have an iPad in front of my face and I don't hear anything for 10 minutes, you know, so I think I have a good laser focus like Joshua, but uh, that's how we need to be with the Lord, and if we do that, I mean, he'll continue to do mighty works um, through our lives and through this church body, and I'll tell you that um, currently, he is doing mighty works in this church. He is restoring lives. He is bringing people back. We sang that song on Sunday, um, Call, call back the sinner and wake up the saint. I, the Lord is doing that. Uh, he really is. Um, and he's doing it in love and kindness only because <clears throat> this church is just focused on the Lord. That's all we care about and just serving him best we can in the mistakes we make, everything. So just I encourage you to keep your, you know, keep that laser focus on the Lord and, and, um, it is so important, the times of devotion and the times of study, because like my day today, there wasn't a place for me to consider the things of the Lord. It was too busy with just work that I'm being paid to do, so it's, I have to honor the Lord and do the work that I'm doing, but, you know, I thought about it today, and it's like, I haven't really, you know, thought about you much today, Lord, and he said, I'm all in all. I'm, take, I'm doing stuff that you're not even seeing. And he's like, I know you love me, and I know like you, you will spend time in my word every day. You will be faithful to the ministries I've called you to, faithful to be a church, all those things. He goes, so don't worry about it. You know, you're doing exactly what you need to be doing. So that's a very, very comforting to know that your laser focus is when you have, when the Lord calls you to be laser focused, be laser focused. Don't miss church. Don't miss devotion time. Be in the word. And if you do all that, then in the times when you're actually just out ministering with people or doing your job, you serve a mighty God who is doing things around you that you don't even know, and spectacular things, and saving people, and it's just awesome. So um, if you think about it, uh, just to wrap it up, you really have no other leg to stand on. That's kind of where I was like, okay, God is good. I don't have another leg to stand on other than to tell you that Jesus is awesome and he is the path to eternal life and um, there's really not much else that I could tell a person. Um, you know, the heart is desperately wicked. Who can trust it? That includes my heart. I don't have a whole lot of faith, you know, in the things, um, you know, that I'm going to be able to, like Paul, I'm going to do things I don't really want to do and I'm not going to do things I should be doing. Um, I know who I am, but the only leg that I have to stand on is just that I believe in Jesus, simple. You know, and it was a great gift that was given to me through some human beings when I was a kid, through my grandparents. <clears throat> and it's a great gift that you all have to give to other people, and I have to give to other people, you know. I'm trying to give it to Joshua, but 
Right now, it's about Winnie the Pooh, and that's okay. <laughs> Not sure what the message of Winnie the Pooh is, but, uh, but it's okay. You know, just spending time with Justin and his family, uh, for me, is um, just one of the greatest gifts. And I know it is for Ingrid, too, um, because that's what my grandparents did for me. And they gave me the Lord, and it was huge, and obviously, in my life. So very, very important. So... Um, Jesus alone can be trusted. That's all I can tell you. Keep your eyes on him, and he will never, never let you down. He is awesome. So let's pray. Father, we do, um, Lord, just lift you up tonight, and just thank you, Lord, that you are so <clears throat> merciful and so gracious and um, so loving. And, uh, Lord, you have given us everything, including um, eternal life in your kingdom. And, Lord, we know who we are. We know the wretched and people that we are. Um, but Lord, we just continue um, to proclaim the gospel and the, the true message, which is how good you are. Um, and that if every eye would turn to you um, and follow you, Lord, that miraculous things would happen and lives would be saved. So Lord, just continue um, to use us as individuals, Lord, to share this great message. Um, of a God that loved you so much that he would give his own life on a cross and suffer terribly, Lord, to take your sin in your place and in my place, Lord, and then you had the power over it, the power over sin and the power over death. Lord, just help us to continue to proclaim that message as people and as a church, Lord. Um, just keep leading and guiding us. We just thank you for your faithfulness. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.